This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 754, recorded on May 11, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. We've got um, 71 degrees, cloudy, headed for 81 this afternoon and thunderstorms. I always welcome rain. We're a little behind this year. From Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 50 Fahrenheit, 11 Celsius, blue sky with puffy clouds. And I was asked on a cousin Zoom recently, why do we do the weather? Why not? And I explained that we're doing conversation and that's what we do. <laughs> Did they like ask in a aggressive you way? No, like, it, was, it was in a friendly way. The person yeah. who had asked my cousin, uh, I think, enjoys it. So, yeah. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. It is also blue skies here, uh, 64 Fahrenheit, 18 Celsius. Um, and I'm excited to, I personally am always excited to hear Kathy's weather to know what I'm going to have tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, you guys all win the weather prize today. Mm -hmm. Good. It's a little bit warmer here in New York than it is in Madison. It is 18 Celsius and cloudy. Yeah, we had a weekend full of rain. Yes, we did. I can always tell how and much it rained because I leave my wheelbarrow out and you could then look at it and see how many inches you got. <laughs> right. Well, now um, we have lots and lots and lots of pollen instead. Uh, um, yes. In fact, I heard multiple jokes this morning about whether we had a pollen fall instead of a snowfall um, the past couple of days. Yeah, last week was our pollen week. Um, covered all the cars. This week less so. And you, you know what? Sunday, I was walking down the driveway, and there's this big patch of mushrooms sprouted in the in the woods, six by six foot patch, nowhere else, just there. Um, it's amazing. Maybe I should show you guys this picture. Well, if you're on Instagram, you could go find it, but I will show it to you right now, and you probably won't be able to see it, but you can see the oh, mushrooms. Oh, yeah. See the mushrooms? Oh, yeah. There? Yeah. That's impressive. Isn't that cool? It's like yeah. hundreds of them. And then, yeah. then all around, nothing. So my son said, well, maybe some animal pooped there, right? And they all came out because that's, that's a good medium for fungi. Vincent, do you, do you throw a, a Bacillus thuringiensis disc in your wheelbarrow so you don't grow mosquitoes? No, because usually I uh, dump it out the next day. But I have a bird bath that I use those in, yeah. Throw those okay. little discs in for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, we were just talking about that, but the, the wheelbarrow gets used often, especially here now in the spring with the garden planting. And this year we have all raised beds. I built over the winter, like 10 wooden raised beds. Right. And now, and, and boy, what a pain. You had to fill them up with mulch and then dirt and all the wheelbarrow. So we broke a wheelbarrow <laughs> doing that. We had an old one, the wood just cracked. So I bought another one and it's all metal. And, um, you know, the, the wheels had gone. You can't find wheelbarrow wheels. It's just crazy. Mm. So now we have raised beds and they're sprouting all kinds of things. Cool. So I said to my wife, do you think the critters won't be able to get in? And she said, I think they'll jump in still probably. <laughs> How high oh. raised are they? Are they waist height or? No, they are just um, like 12 inches, right? Yeah. Okay. Because make them too high. And oh, one of the cool things. So we had planted a, a lot of stuff and put little plastic tags with what's what there was written on it. Mm -hmm. And we went out yesterday. They're all gone. Hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. what, the birds take them for their nest or something? Oh, I have a Twitter picture to send you about that. But um, I've always heard the joke that you put those out so that the rabbits know exactly what they're eating. <laughs> do the rabbits right, that makes sense. Do the rabbits take the signs? Oh, the signs are gone. And it's like, now we don't know what it is anymore. Ah, anyway, sorry, folks, to, to chat so long, but this is conversation 
And that's why you have a fast forward button on your podcast player. You know, you can go 30 <laughs> second advances and get past all this. All right. We have a few announcements. Uh, someone tell us about the vaccine education town halls. Go for it, Brian. Okay. So the American Society of Virology is having um, some vaccine education town halls where a number of different experts um, will come together and answer your questions about vaccines for about 45 minutes. Um, there are some of these town halls um, sort of scattered throughout uh, on lots of different evenings throughout May, and they're going on for a while. Um, and you can sign up at asv.org uh, backslash education to get more information and potentially uh, go to one of these town halls and get somebody to answer all of your questions. Just one little update. We're working on getting some more in Spanish. And in fact, Vincent Susana Lopez uh, wrote to us about it. Good. And so, um, and a uh, little foreshadowing, she has another book and it's getting translated into English now. Another cool. A brand book. new book. Yeah. Brand new yeah. book. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very good. Oh, the other ones, the other two are, are about, well, one is about uh, measles and vaccines. Mm -hmm. And the, Paul has measles, right? And the other one is mm -hmm. Paul stays home about mm -hmm. COVID. And they yeah. all translate into many languages, right? Yeah. And the next one is, uh, and it's already on face on the uh, Mexican Society for Virology Facebook page in Spanish, but it's... Um, Paul and mosquitoes. So it's going to be about arboviruses. Ah, neat. Nice. Uh, World Microbe Forum, Kathy. Okay. So people who've been listening to TWIV and I, I suspect TWIM as well have heard an opening at the beginning from American Society for Microbiology talking about the World Microbe Forum, which replaces ASM's microbe, their annual meeting. And it's combined with the Federation of European Microbiological Societies, known as FEMS. And they also enlisted support from a number of other societies, including American Society for Virology. And ASV has specifically organized three sessions all on coronaviruses with some speakers that you'll recognize because they've been on TWIV and others that you may want to have heard on TWIV but haven't yet. And so go to worldmicrobeforum.org and ASM members, members of ASV, members of FEMS, um, the Australian Virology Society, several other organizations get discounted uh, registration for, uh, for the meeting. And so the meeting is from a Sunday through a Thursday, June, uh, I don't have the dates right here, but worldmicrobeforum.org. It's around June 20, 20th to 24th, something like that, so, uh, Sunday through Thursday. Um, so... Uh, some of them are, uh, they're going to be pre-recorded talks, but some of them will have a live Q&A and then some of them will have uh, a Q&A session grouped together afterward with all the speakers from a session or something. Um, some of them are released at six in the morning and some of them are released at specific times of day. So uh, something for everyone. Hmm. Check it out. And the Michelson Prizes. Who put that in? I put that in. Um, I thought maybe they sent it to you as well. These are annual awards of $150,000 to support young investigators under the age of 35 who are using disruptive <laughs> concepts and inventive processes to significantly advance human immunology and vaccine and immunotherapy discovery research for major, major global diseases. That is a real mouthful. Um, but basically... Um, these prizes are funded by the Michelson Medical Research Foundation, overseen by the Human Vaccines Project. The application is June 18th, 2021. And so the link is humanvaccinesproject.org, all one word, humanvaccinesproject.org, and we'll have the link in the show notes. $150,000 supporting young investigators, disrupting concepts and inventing processes for human immunology what and vaccines. What is a disruptive <laughs> concept? <laughs> oh. <I don't> know. <laughs> Maybe CRISPR? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, picture, yeah. I picture somebody standing out in the street with a sign, you know, <laughs> protesting this or that. Yeah. Well, you know, in tech, disruptive things are like, you know, um, what's the taxi thing? Uh, 
where you Uber get Uber and Lyft. Uber and Lyft, right? That was disruptive mm. to the taxi industry. <laughs> So, yeah. right. Anything that comes along so, and knocks something out. Sufficiently novel to shake up the yeah, shake up para, yeah. the standard paradigm. Yeah, right. Exactly. I guess podcasting years ago was disruptive for radio, right? To a certain extent, mm -hmm. um, probably will displace it eventually entirely. Uh, I don't think of disruptive all that much in science, though. You know, I don't, so CRISPR is kind of an. It's a great idea, is, right? The evolution of a wonderful discovery. Is it disruptive? I don't know if it's it dis literally disruptive. Yeah, it, it is it literally, is literally <laughs> disruptive. Yeah, that's why you said that, Brianne, yeah, right? Yeah, it is. All right. Um, uh, good news from Pfizer BioNTech. Someone said, why did you just call it the Pfizer vaccine? It's both. Okay. Pfizer BioNTech. They have licensed their mRNA vaccine for use in adolescents. 12 to 15 years of age, which means finally I can get vaccinated. <laughs> you don't think I'm 15 now? Huh? Okay. No, my granddaughter's really excited about this. Yes. Te technically, they're not uh, giving the vaccine to the 12 to 15 year old age group yet. Mm -hmm. um, so the CDC still needs to meet, the ACIP still needs to meet, um, but they're hoping maybe by the end of the week, they'll be able to uh, start vaccinating this group. How many 12 to 15 year olds are there in the US? I don't know. Good question. I don't know. But I think they're 30 million under 18 or something like that. Uh, is that right? Well, my wife and I were discussing the other night that the, uh, the uh, largest f section of the population are the youngest people, all of which makes sense because you start dying the minute you're born, okay? We start losing people. Okay. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. wow, there's actually a table of all of that number of child child population in the U.S. by age. Um, yeah. Wow. In the same place, it auto filled. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I, it's too many numbers. I can't even read. But it. But you'd think we'd have the number for you by now. Childstats.gov. Uh, uh, Vincent, do you have your little uh, delay thing on again? Your lips are moving and no sound is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything on. No, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, a couple of times that has happened. Yeah, I don't know what it is. We have to I have to get a new studio. Uh, then it'll fix it in a couple of weeks. Um, all right. So that's great news. And I'm sure eventually they'll be getting it and kids will, many kids will get the vaccine. I've gotten a lot of emails from people asking why. So they only looked at 2,260 kids in this trial. And they're saying, why is that enough? Because the other trials were all 30 and 40,000 people. And the way it broke down, no COVID in the vaccine group, which is 1,005 kids, 16 cases in the placebo, 978. That's 100% efficacy. I don't know the answer. I suppose it was clearly powered, right? Sufficiently mm -hmm. powered. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. The FDA wouldn't have authorized it, right? And I think it, it does build on the thirty to 45,000 that have already been tested. Yes. You know, of course. So. Yeah, it has to it has to build on the safety and the efficacy, but it also it's a different population. So um, I think it was the numbers were just enough to give it what they needed. Yeah. That's and the best if you think about you think about sort of the age group that they previously tested and how many years are in that divided by twenty or thirty thousand. And then you say, well, now we've got, what, three years worth of people. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It sort of makes sense. So what's the status on the below, um, what is it, 12 years of age? Does so it? Pfizer has announced that they are hoping to apply for approval by September for the two years to 11 years group. Hmm. Right. I think some trials uh, for, for both companies are existing from six to... Uh, whatever, 12 or 11. Yeah, M Moderna has a trial actually that starts at six months that's enrolling that's right meant. now. Six to yeah. months, yeah. Um, it's a little bit further mm -hmm. behind. So in, in the fall then, the younger kids will be able to be vaccinated, right? That's the idea. I think that's the hope, yeah. Okay. So both Moderna and Pfizer have, a, have trials ongoing that start at six months? I believe so. I think so. I know Moderna does. Um, I think they both do. 
Okay. All right, we have a paper for you today from the from Nature Immunology. TLR2 senses the SARS-CoV-2 envelope protein to produce inflammatory cytokines. Zong, Karki, Williams, Yang, Fitzpatrick, Vogel, Johnson, Kaniganti from St. Jude's in Memphis, University of Tennessee in Memphis. I don't know if we've ever done a nature immunology paper on TWIV. Really? I just don't remember. I don't know, but don't get scared. This is a really great paper. It was really easy to understand, yeah. and it's a yeah. cool story. Straightforward. Very well done. And it's relevant, and it's got basic science, and it's peer-reviewed. It's published. I really like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that we can move, move towards uh, peer review. And I thought Brianne would be excited about this because it involves Absolutely. innate immune responses and sensing. And we used to do some work on this as well years ago. We've actually published on it. So... As everyone should know, you know, COVID-19, the disease, has components of a viral infection, as Daniel likes to say, the viral phase <laughs> and the inflammatory phase uh, later on when your immune response is driving pathogenesis. As they say, pro-inflammatory cytokine release is a feature of the disease. Dysregulated release of such cytokines, a word now that some people have steered away from cytokine storm, but they actually use it here and they were allowed to keep it. Uh, and we don't really understand uh, what's driving this dysregulated release. I was at a doctor's yesterday and this is a doctor who trained here at Columbia, you know, that's theoretically a good doc. And he, he said, why is it that a perfectly healthy person gets sick, so sick? And others don't. I say, well, I don't have time to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are reasons. Yeah, I think one thing that's important for people to realize about this is that throughout this paper, they are talking largely about um, inflammatory cytokines like um, TNF-alpha or IL-6 or IL-1 beta. Usually when we think about the cytokine response to viral infection, we're thinking about a type 1 interferon response. Mm -hmm. We frequently focus on those. Um, here we're seeing sort of this other group of cytokines, which are not talked about quite as frequently in response to viral infection. Um, and that seem to be related to the inflammatory pathology that Daniel talks about. And so these cytokines can kill cells. They can cause damage. And so mm -hmm. that's the underlining pathology. So a little background. So this is all about sensing an infection quite early on before adaptive responses are kicking in, uh, the innate immune system. And the innate immune system recognizes what we call pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. Uh, and the, the way that's done is via pattern recognition receptors. And there are a bunch of them. There are five so far that we know of, like the toll-like receptors. There are nucleotide binding oligomerization domain, nod-like receptors. That's what I do in my car driving home. I nod-like receptors. <laughs> uh, uh, NLR. So the NOD is part of NLR. And then we have rig eye and uh, the rig eye like receptors. C-type lectin receptors, and here's a wonderful name, absent in melanoma 2, AIM-2 like receptors. <laughs> and these receptors sense a variety of PAMPs like, you know, cell wall parts of bacteria, LPS, uh, various sugars, proteins like flagellin, uh, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. And there's always some way that they're distinguished uh, from the host because aside from LPS, the host has many of these other th things as well. So there's a, a range of receptors. And this, this paper focuses on toll-like receptors and how they're involved in, in this inflammatory uh, syndrome. And, and they begin by looking at um, toll-like receptors. So when, when a toll-like receptor binds a, a ligand, it initiates a signaling cascade, meaning there's a series of phosphorylation events that go through various intermediates in the cell. And the downstream event is transcription in the nucleus of the, of the cytokine genes. And then those mRNAs come out into the cytosol, the proteins are made. And so um, many of the TLRs have in common an intermediary protein in the cytosol called MyD88. And they're looking at TLRs in MyD88 
uh, initially here. And we have some history here. We know people have studied this in the, in the mouse hepatitis virus, coronavirus, right, which Susan Weiss has talked about twice recently. It's a great model for, for studying coronaviruses, and you can work on it in a BSL-2 lab. It doesn't infect people. And SARS-CoV-1 has also been studied. And from those, it's been implied that toll-like receptors and MyD88 are important. So they say, what's the story with SARS-CoV-2? So the first thing they do is they look at uh, a data set, which is publicly available, of expression of the MyD88 and TRIF gene. TRIF is the other intermediary between uh, the TLR and the, and the induction of cytokine production in patients with uh, different severities of COVID. So that's kind of cool. You can say, is there any correlation? So they found that MyD88 has a positive correlation with the pathogenesis of COVID. And TRIF was only elevated in patients with critical COVID. Um, then they go back and they look at the data for, for TLR expression. And they found that TLR2 was increased. The more severe COVID, the more TLR2, kind of like MyD88. Uh, the other TLRs were, were all elevated. That's one, four, five, eight, and nine in patients with severe and critical COVID. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so there are a couple of things that are, to me, really interesting about this. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them is that throughout this paper there, or at least throughout this part of the figure, they're looking at the expression level. So they're looking at the transcript right. of um, these TLRs. Um, and uh, I guess it was, what, six months ago, um, there was a paper looking at some genetic defects yeah. Um, yeah. in um, COVID patients. And that one sort of highlighted TLR3. Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> But again, that one's, but that was looking at the DNA yeah. and changes in the gene. Here we're looking at changes in expression level. Yeah. Um, and one caveat to that paper was that they only looked at very, very severe patients. Um, and so I really like this because we can see, particularly with MIDI 88 and TLR2, that there's sort of this range where as the patient has more and more severe disease, um, if they look at healthy versus moderate versus severe versus critical, there's sort of this correlation um, yeah. that you yeah. have more expression as the disease gets uh, much more severe. Um, and, you know, as I look at this um, and I think about these different TLRs, you know, the, the first ones I would look at thinking about this were TLR three, seven and eight, um, because those recognize RNA and we're thinking about an RNA virus and three has no significance and seven and eight are only significant in the very severe patients. Um, and TLR two is usually thought of in, in the textbook. I you know teach it as thinking about as responding to peptidoglycan. Um, and so um, that sort of, you know, uh, got my attention quickly um, because TLR2 is not one that I would have expected um, to show up here. It does recognize some viral proteins, though. Right. As well, like respiratory syncytial virus, like a protein and others. So, but yeah, it's interesting that, well, of course, here, this is RNA, which again, you have to do some experiments to show what's going on, but it's interesting that TLR3 drops out here <laughs> in this study, whereas, as you mentioned, the genetic study. So then and they that just- was the most That was the most striking thing of all about yeah. this figure is just how dead TLR3 was mm -hmm. in the response. Yeah, and this is where you need to look in people, right? I mean, you, the history of this field is people have looked in cell lines for years at these, these various sensors, right? You can find things in cells, but they may not mean anything in an animal, right? And we, we, we've we looked at that too. You know, if you look at them in HeLa cells, who cares? Look at an animal or look in humans. So that's what they're doing here. Yeah. And I really like kind of thinking about what the importance of looking at the expression level versus looking at yeah. the gene um, yeah. and sort of reason that, reasons that both of those things could alter phenotype. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the gene can have a mutation that could alter it, but also the promoter may be altered, which would, uh, you know, alter expression level. And both can be problem. All right. So they do some experiments in cells. They make, uh, in mice, they may, may make macrophages from the bone marrow of mice and they infect them with murine, mouse hepatitis virus. 
which they can work on in any laboratory. You could even work on this at Drew University if you wanted you to. could. Because there's no BSL-3 there. And so this, um, you know, in one of the, one of the um, additional background bits we have to tell you about is a cytosolic protein complex called NF-kappa B, which is involved in a signaling pathway uh, leading to uh, production of uh, cytokines. And they find that when they infect uh, these murine macrophages with MHV, it activates NF-kappa B. Um, and, and of course, they have mice that are lacking genes for many of these mediators, like MyD88 and the TLRs, as we'll see later. If you take MyD88 away, uh, then you don't see activation of NF-kappa B after infection. There's also another... Um, Another kinase involved in the signaling is called extracellular signal related kinase. That's also dependent on MyD88 as well. Uh, however, you don't need TRIF for activation after infection. Um, <clears throat> so um, you can also look at the role of some of the cytosolic sensors uh, like MDA5 and so forth, uh, and they do that. And, and, and then for those, you can look at the induction of interferon and in fact, um, they find that MDA5, as people have found before, is needed for indu induction of uh, interferon after infection. But the bottom line here is that you need MyD88 for uh, inflammatory cytokine expression, and you need MDA5 for type 1 interferon uh, expression, as, as Brian mentioned earlier. We think about those two things separately. All right, so then which toll-like receptor is involved? There are a slew of them. Um, and um, they they basically take mice lacking the genes for each one of the TLRs. They can make bone marrow derived macrophages for each of them, and then infect them uh, with mouse hepatitis virus. And uh, we're going to get to some other viruses in a moment. Don't worry, don't touch that dial, and and, and look at the expression of inflammatory cytokine genes. So if you take out TLR4, 7, and 9, no effect on expression. They looked at IL-1B, IL-6, and TNF. However, without TLR2, you don't get transcription of those genes after infection with MHV. So looks like TLR2 is the sensor that's triggering uh, these uh, MHV-induced inflammatory cytokines. Um, they also... Um, um, they also look at ERK and NF-kappa B, as we discussed before, that the activation of those is also gone in TLR2 null macrophages. Uh, they also look at the production of the cytokines uh, themselves, um, which, you know, is a step beyond what we've already done. And um, basically the result is that they think TLR2 is uh, is needed for the production of these pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, after, at least after MHV infection. So what about people? Uh, so there have been studies on measuring serum cytokines in patients with COVID, of course, tons of them. And they've shown many, many cytokines and chemokines go up, including IL-6, TNF-alpha, and many others, and that the they positively correlate with disease severity. So higher levels associate with higher disease. So uh, they took uh, human peripheral blood mononuclear cells. They infect them now with SARS-CoV-2, okay? And they do it with and without an inhibitor of TLR2. So the field is full of these wonderful stimulators and inhibitors of, of all of these uh, receptors. And there's one, um, so there is an inhibitor, OxPAPC, and they have a stimulator of TLR2, PAM3. All right, so they set up a system where they can stimulate TLR2 and then inhibit it at the same time. And then they can ask, okay, if we inhibit TLR2 signaling with this uh, inhibitor, PAM3, and then in fact with SARS-CoV-2, what happens? Reduced production of these cytokines and chemokines. It's a, good, it's a cool experiment. And they could do the same experiment with a TLR4 inhibitor. No effect on the production. So it looks like TLR2 is it. 
or at least the ma a main one, at least so far in, in MHV infection of bone of bone marrow max and also in uh, peripheral blood cells from humans infected with SARS-CoV-2. Good so far? Good so Good. far. Um, I guess the, the, you know, just thinking about the, the next part of it, you know, again, this makes you think, well, okay, so what part of the virus would stimulate TLR2? That's right. Um, because again, we usually think of, oh, the, the TLRs, at least that are, are responding to viruses, again, in, in the classic sense, are the ones that respond to nucleic acid. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't know what's what, going on uh, with TLR2. Yeah, I don't know what they were. So they had these data and they said, okay, what's being recognized? So what, what do we know? TLR2 can sense a variety of ligands from not just viruses, but bacteria and, and fungi and parasites. It can sense viral proteins like a uh, DUTPase of Epstein-Barr virus, a glycoprotein of cytomegalovirus, a capsid protein of hepatitis B virus. So they said, um, let's uh, see if it recognizes a uh, coronavirus protein. So the first thing they do is they heat and activate mouse hepatitis virus. And when you add that to cells, still bone marrow-derived macrophages of mice still activates the production of uh, the cytokines that they're measuring. And that activation is eliminated in either TLR2 null or MyD88 null macrophages. Okay. So and that's important. <laughs> I was just going to say, we might want to describe what heat inactivation is doing. And I didn't look up the details of the heat inactivation, but um, it's basically going to be denaturing the proteins and and making them non-functional. So it's go ahead. Yeah, the the main the main thing that I think about is that the virus here is not going to be able to reproduce. So it's not so to me I look at this as a question of is uh the the thing that's triggering TLR2 um some part of the original viral particle or is it something that is made during replication? Mm -hmm. Um which you know, to me, my first thought would be some of the nucleic acid intermediates. Um, but obviously, it's anything that's made during uh, replication. Right. So um, and so here they say because um, heat and activation doesn't uh, destroy or heat and activation still uh, lets you um, get this cytokine production. Whatever ligand is inducing cytokine production must have been present on the initial virion. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and. So you, the heat inactivated particle can probably attach to the cell. It might even be taken up, but it's not going to reproduce, as you say. In fact, that's what they do next is to say, what if we inhibit uptake of the virus by a drug like chloroquine? <laughs> chloroquine can inhibit viral entry, right? We know that. It's not a, it's not a good drug to treat COVID, but <laughs> it does. it's experimentally very useful. So they say, if we inhibit entry with chloroquine, what are we going to see in terms of activation of TLR2? So they treat the bone marrow-derived macrophages with chloroquine, and they infect with MHV, heat-inactivated MHV. You still get production of, of TLR2-dependent um, cytokines. So even with chloroquine, which is presumably inhibiting uptake. So they're saying, well, maybe it just gets recognized, the virus particle gets recognized on the cell surface. And so here, um, they do acute experiment. SARS-CoV-2 cannot bind to mouse cells. There's no, there's, the ACE2 isn't right, right? So they, they say, well then, can we still get activation of these TLR2 dependent signaling pathways in mouse cells with SARS-CoV-2? The answer is yes. Because apparently just recognition of the virus particle at the cell surface by TLR2 is enough to activate these pathways. So before the virus even gets in the cell, on the surface, they are being the particles are being recognized by uh, TLR2. That's pretty so I just I just want to back up a little bit because I, I don't want to have led people astray about what heating does. Mm -hmm. um, and what I was going to then say was, Usually I think about doing these kinds of experiments with UV inactivated virus, yeah. which would um, definitely 
uh, mess up the nucleic acid and keep it from replicating. Yeah. But this is a, a different thing that I haven't seen as often. So uh, yeah, you see this in the literature, the pox literature occasionally. Um, mm. And I looked, I, I had a quick search through the article itself for heat inactivation. The protocol's not right there. We'd have to look into the, and maybe I'll do this while we're talking, look into the supplementary uh, information. But usually it's some sort of, uh, you know, it's not like boiling it, which would truly denature the proteins. Uh, it's usually something like somewhere between like 50 and 60 or 65 degrees for some period of time, which is going to, uh, you know, cause enough harm so that the virus doesn't work anymore, but it's not going to wildly denature any of the proteins. All right. All right. So you can just take a virus particle on the cell surface, apparently active. It's recognized by TLR2. You make the cytokines. So what viral protein is it? And everybody knows that in the virus, there's spike, right? <laughs> Everyone knows that after the past year. But there are also two other uh, membrane proteins. There's the membrane protein M and there's the envelope E protein, which don't get a lot of attention these days, right? So there had been previous data which suggested that you can you can make some coronaviruses without E, and uh, some of them will reproduce. And uh, there's some evidence that E is needed to activate NF kappa B, which is what part of this the results we mentioned earlier. So they said, let's look at E. So they make E protein, they purify it, they add it to mouse murine bone marrow derived macrophages. Boom activates uh, the TLR2 dependent signaling pathways. Amazing. Just the protein itself. Um, S protein, they do the same experiment. Nada. No activation uh, by S protein. They even put different doses of E protein in and show that the activation is dose dependent. Um, so looks like E is at least doing something, at least purified E. And and Vincent put in a, a nice review article about coronavirus E proteins. I had no idea these are so small. <laughs> yes, From they're tiny. Eight point yeah. four to twelve kilodaltons in size, yep. seventy six to one hundred and nine amino acids. So really, really short. Yep, they are. They are membrane proteins. They are in the particle. Um, much smaller than the spike, though they get dwarfed. I have. Yeah. This, I, I was sent a model. A, printed model of spike, which is really cool. And the, the spike is huge red thing. And then the, the e protein are just little blips on the surface of the membrane. M2, M2 is small. Do, do we know uh, much about what e protein's role is in viral replication? Well, this review is, there's a whole review, uh, relatively recent, which talks about it. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, every coronavirus has the E gene, but not all of them seem to need it for reproduction. For some, if you take it out, it inactivates reproduction, or if, and for others, maybe it attenuates pathogenesis. It seems to be a pore. It seems to form a, pore, form a pore in the cell membrane and allow passage, I think, of sodium and potassium ions, and mainly in the ER Golgi intermediate compartment, from what I understood, and not clear why, what it's doing, right? Why is it acting as a pore? But, um, you know, the virus buds into that compartment. That's probably why it picks up some of this E protein on the way out. So I think the real function is in the cell, but I couldn't I couldn't glean from that review what exactly it's doing. I don't think people yeah. know. They list assembly, budding, envelope <laughs> formation, and pathogenesis. Oh, pretty narrow, huh? <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Which translates so to, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of things. Yeah. Um. So the um, remember the activation of ERK and NF kappa B that we talked about earlier. Uh, it's also those act signaling is needed for upregulation of NLRP3, one of those um, sensors that we talked about earlier. And so they looked at the role of E protein and show that um, e, e, e protein can uh, ac activate uh, that inflammasome as well. So. And, and that's a TLR2 dependent pathway. So um, the e, e seems to be involved in both. It's quite interesting. Yeah, so, so that's basically a 
innate immune pathway from one of those other groups of um, sensors when Vincent Les did the five groups of sensors here. Um, and so we can see that some of these different types of sensing processes are uh, interlinked or interrelated. Um, and so, in fact, um, you can see that E is also turning on the transcription uh, pathways that might be needed for some of those other inflammasome pathways as well. So that was all in mouse cells. <clears throat> what about human cells? So they take human peripheral blood mononuclear cells. They add either purified E or S protein. And, um, and this is, again, from SARS-CoV-2. And they measure cytokine production. Works. Turns on these, the E protein turns on cytokine production. S does not. Uh, and uh, they also did immunoprecipitations to see if E interacts with TLR2, and it does. You can find both human and mouse TLR2 interacting with the E protein physically. So it looks like um, TLR2 senses E to turn on these uh, the production of the inflammatory cytokines. E's not glycosylated or anything like that, is it? Is is it modified at all? I'm trying to figure out uh, uh, what it is about this protein that uh, TLR2 is seeing. You know, the big why. Why this? Yes, it is glycosylated. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Yes. It's an end link glycosylation. Yep. So, uh, not clear. Not that that's unusual at all, but I wonder if there's some some weird some weird glycosylation or other that uh, TLR2 recognizes as suspicious of, you know, not being, mm -hmm. you know, sort of your normal cellular me type. You know, all of these, all of these um, receptors are looking for trouble. Okay. <laughs> they are. All right. They're yeah. looking for things that shouldn't be there. All right. And so I'm, um, it's, it's going to be in my mind, it's going to be, I mean, I'm making this up, but in my mind, it's going to be more than just like your standard run of the mill protein. It's going to be, you know, most of these PAMPs, uh, what is it? Pathogen associated molecular patterns are unusual molecules of one sort or another that cells don't ordinarily make. Okay. So I'm wondering what is it about E that TLR2 is, um, uh, excited about. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and that's actually really the, the point that you were making that it's not just your normal run of the mill protein. It's some feature uh, of the protein is actually pretty important. Um, when we think about PRRs and um, PAMPs, because usually the idea with these things that bind to uh, PRRs is that they are structures that aren't easily um, altered by mutation. So that the microbe is not easily going to, um, mutate around recognition. Aren't we clever? That's very cool. And so, you know, that's why you have a receptor for LPS. The microbe is not going to reinvent the structure of LPS. Right. Um, even though Lipo it may try- Polysaccharide for the yeah. uh, newbies out there. <laughs> um, and so, so that's usually what's going on here is that these are receptors for sort of conserved structures that both mm -hmm. allow- recognition of a broad array of microbes instead of being really specific, as well as that are not easily um, changeable by mutation. Can you tell I'm writing an exam for tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> that covers exactly this. <laughs> All right. Good. So what's the connection between E and the pathogenesis? So they ask in mice, if we, if we give uh, E to mice, what happens? So if you give mice PAM3, remember PAM3 is the activator of TLR2, you get lots of uh, lymphocyte infiltration into the lungs. If you give E protein, <laughs> you also get infiltration into the lungs of mice, but not mice that lack TLR2 gene. Um, and S doesn't do it either. S given to mice, intratracheal installation, they put a tube down into the trachea, put a, spritz a little E in, S doesn't do it. Only E does it. It's very cool. Um, so, the, and they can also look at uh, microscopy. They can look at uh, damage to cells, which they see. They see cell death when you give E protein, but not S. And they can measure the concentrations of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines in the mi in the serum of the mice after you give them E protein intratracheally, and they get I elevation of IL six, for example. 
uh, but not in TLR2 null mice. Uh, other chemokines also uh, ele elevated. Now they can also do a bronchioalveolar lavage, put a little tube in the down into the bronchi and put a little PBS in, pull it out and measure uh, chemokines after giving E protein. And there you see increased levels of these uh, cytokines and chemokines. So not just in the serum, but it's it's in the lung as well. So it's pretty cool. It's very comprehensive and uh, very convincing, right? E protein is doing all this. Uh, I think it's neat. So I want to make just a couple of things I've been thinking about. First of all, for <clears throat> uh, for those who are not, you know, in the weeds with us, uh, I don't think we actually <laughs> said <clears throat> that mouse hepatitis virus is a coronavirus, just to make sure that that's true. So uh, you might go back and listen to the whole thing again with that understanding. I'm always, <clears throat> I always like experiments that used um, matched host and pathogen. Okay, mm -hmm. so mouse with mouse cells, human with human cells. I also like experiments that use, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to do in vitro experiments, that is cell culture experiments, but yeah. I like I like cell culture experiments that use um, relevant cells that are as close to primary cells as can be. Uh, and that is the case here. We're using uh, mouse macrophages. I don't. I didn't look to see if it was a line or whether it was fresh out of mice. So, so with the their bone marrow drive max. So okay. what you do is you take uh, bone marrow out of tibias and femurs usually, um, and then you grow the stem cells from the bone marrow in culture for about a week, um, along with growth factors to differentiate them into macrophages. Okay. So do um, uh, human peripheral blood mononuclear cells for me. Uh, Brianne, that's going to be uh, max and dendritic cells. Is that right? Something like that. So it's actually uh, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells are max and dendritic cells, as well as T cells and B cells. Okay, um, so they're the majority of the white blood cells. Uh, but in both these cases, these uh, cell populations contain the cells that actually in the animal are doing this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're the ones that are really responsible for responding to these signals and uh, 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 sending out signals themselves. Is that a fair statement, Brian? Yeah, for the most part. Technically, the the bone marrow max from the mice are a little artificial because you've grown. They've differentiated in a dish instead of being max that you took straight out of a mouse. Um, but they are the thing that people tend to work with. Um, because they are the, something that you can get a lot of um, to do an experiment and they're pretty close to being straight out of the mouse. The, the other ones that you will pull straight out of a mouse um, tend to be, free, be at very low frequency. Right. So the other thing that uh, interests me here is the apparent conservation of this phenomenon uh, from mouse to humans. Uh, and uh, it makes me wonder how similar is TLR2 from mouse to humans? How similar is um, uh, the uh, E-protein from MHV to SARS-CoV-2? Um, and could you do the mixed experiment, all right? Treat the uh, human cells with the mouse uh, envelope protein and vice versa, uh, and can you learn anything from those experiments about what the what the real mechanism uh, that we were talking about before of the stimulation is? Do you do you have any idea, Brianne, about conservation at least of TLR two? Um, I don't know specifically the conservation of TLR two, but in general, many of these PRRs are pretty highly conserved um, mm -hmm. between mouse and human, and in fact. Um, there are even domains that are similar in plant immune proteins. Okay. Um, and so they're and pretty broadly conserved. I don't know the specifics for TLR2. From a functional point of view, they're probably generally reacting to the same sort of uh, stimuli, right? For the most part. There are a couple of TLRs that are outliers on that front, but for the most part, yes. Okay. Now looking at the different E protein sequences in this review for alpha, beta, and gamma coronaviruses and... Yeah, they have, you know, the uh, C-terminus, there's a little conserved region of four amino acids, right, which is very similar in all the viruses that they're looking at, about eight viruses for each genus. So could be that there's a motif. 
Yeah, they conserved. used uh, synthetic e protein yeah, to they, do this, they right? Made, yeah, they made. Did the, they say how they made it? I'm sure they did. Okay. It must be because if we're talking about uh, post translational modifications like glycosylation or something, that's gonna uh, that's gonna be affected by how you make the protein. I, if if it's expressed in cells, great. If it's like uh, expressed in coli, right? That would be different. You don't actually have a section in the methods at all for protein production and purification. Gene expression analysis, no SARS-CoV-2 culture, MHV. No, they don't. Like the heat inactivation we didn't find. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I uh, can't find detailed methods. Maybe it's in the supplementary data. I looked at, well, I don't know about, there's a, no. No. Maybe Interesting. buried somewhere. At any rate, okay. That so would those be are a questions. pretty easy experiment to do. They've got both MHV and SARS-CoV-2E, right? They could do the mix and yeah, match. Yeah, I really want to know in detail what the, what TLR2 is seeing here. Sure. I yep. don't know why I want to know that, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, last experiment. What about mortality? If you block TLR2, do you alter the disease course in any way? So here they're using ACE2 transgenic mice, so human ACE2 transgenic mice. And now you can infect them. They get some lung inflammation. And remember, these they don't develop serious uh, disease, um, but they do develop infl inflammatory response. And so they infect the mice uh they put the virus into the respiratory tract, and then they give an, a TLR2 inhibitor uh, in the course of the infection. And this reduces the uh, re release of the cytokines that they've been looking at, and it causes increased survival of the mice compared to mice treated with just uh, saline. And it, the mice treated with the TLR2 inhibitor, uh, their body weight decreases more slowly compared uh, to the control group. So seems to uh, slightly ameliorate the uh, disease when you give a, a, a blocker of TLR2, um, which is consistent with much of what they've been saying so far. It's interesting because, um, you know, patients are treated with, right, not to block IL-6, either the, the the, the ligand or the receptor in, with, with monoclonals. And it doesn't work in every one because there are probably other cytokines that are important depending on the patient. But this is more upstream, right? TLR2. So if you block that, that could be interesting. On the other hand, as they say, it's also needed to limit <laughs> infection. So you don't want right. to block all TLR2 dependent. Right. So you have to well, use a more fine approach than that, I guess. And, and I would assume that this would also be something that would really vary based on when you would deliver it. Yes. Um, since it's blocking um, the PRR interaction with a viral protein, um, it probably would have to be delivered pretty early. Yeah, it could be, but then, I mean, if you're in this viral phase and we don't know if you're going to get into the late phase, I don't know if you'd want to block it at that point. I just don't know. Maybe if you have a, maybe if you're 65 and over, you'd want to block it, right? I just don't know. Right. You know, you get your first positive test if you're 65 and up or you have a comorbidity, yeah, then maybe you want to do it. But you'd have to do a trial to figure out what's the outcome. So right? one of the questions that we've had since the beginning of this, and I go back to maybe our first interview with Ralph Barrick, uh, is, you know, what's, what's is SARS-CoV-2 special in terms of its pathogenesis in humans? Or is it just basically another now human coronavirus? Okay. So that makes me wonder if uh, the E protein from the other human coronaviruses would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I would, I can't imagine that they wouldn't. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it's still, it's still a question. Yeah. I, I would bet they would as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I think that, um, I've seen some really interesting data. And to be honest with you, it was at a conference and I can't remember if it was from uh, Vineet Manachary or Ben Tenover because their talks were back to back. And it was it was that day <laughs> um, that talked about differences in the balance between different cytokines, between the inflammatory cytokines that are here and interferons and SARS-CoV-2 kind of specifically altering the balance in a way that some other viruses uh, 
don't alter that that balance. And so I would kind of be interested to, to again, look at this in terms of does this also impact what's going on with the interferon? And mm-hmm. is this related to that balance of those cytokines? So, they, Rich, they say here that it was previously shown that SARS-CoV-1 lacking E does not activate NF-kappa B. And that leads to much less inflammatory cytokine production in mice. So um, I think probably, uh, yes, it, it, it does for, and maybe MERS does as well. I just, they haven't mentioned it here. It would make sense, yeah. So this is very interesting because here we have E, which is being largely ignored, I think, and it's activating TLR2 and may be responsible for at least part of the cytokine storm. And maybe you could think about targeting TLR2. Um, they had one thing they brought up, which I kind of tickled me, not, not in a good way, um, made me start thinking. They say, beyond the potential blocking TLR2, so they're thinking about antibodies that would block TLR2. Antibodies targeting the E protein could also neutralize the virus particles. But I'm not, I looked and I'm not aware of any studies that have been done to address that. Probably a, a seasoned coronavirologist would know better. But uh, do antibodies to E neutralize virus particles? I would, it's so tiny sticking above the membrane. And what would be the mechanism? Right, I'm not sure. It's, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the other thing I was thinking, throughout this is the one of the other things that we've talked about frequently is um you know uh are we making a mistake in the vaccines relying entirely on spike and shouldn't we express other viral proteins uh that could uh uh, affect the immune response and i'm thinking as i'm reading this not e okay (laughs) let's not do that Yeah, I think that this sort of shows us a benefit of having the uh, vaccines just be spike vaccines instead of um, some other type of vaccine that includes uh, the E protein. Yeah. I guess you would pick that up pretty early in preclinical animal studies. Uh, Yeah, it wouldn't pass the safety trials. Yeah. Right? Yep. Well, I mean, maybe. I don't know. But yes, it would show up early on as as not good if it were not good. All right. So there you go. You have a... TLR2 mediated <clears throat> sensing of E of SARS-CoV-2, which leads to the production of inflammatory cytokines. Really good insight into uh, disease processes, maybe identifying a new therapeutic approach. So very cool. Yeah, this is good. I liked it. Okay, I thought that uh, that would do it for today. Tuesday is turning out to be a, a SARS. Kovi two day. I'm sorry to say, Kathy. <laughs> no, it's all right. And two stay. SARS CoV two and TLR two. <laughs> if it's Tuesday, it's SARS CoV two and TLR two day. That could be a title. Yeah, could be I'm a working title. on it. All right, let's do some email. Uh, the first one is from John. It's high to it. I'm wondering if I can make a request. My wife is Amy, and she's one of your biggest fans. She's a physician, listens to your podcast religiously, tells all her friends about you. She has the Twiv to go coffee mug, and the sweatshirt, and the regular coffee mug, and the tote bag. <laughs> so do some of her friends because she buys them as gifts. At some point last year, you read one of her letters about your podcast being COVID porn, and it made her month. <laughs> remember that. Amy volunteers to lead the COVID committee at our daughter's preschool in Lincoln, MA, LNS, what, what? Uh, with weekly Zoom meetings, weekly testing, first individual now pooled and constant emails and updates to protocols and procedures. She and her fellow committee members have worked countless volunteer hours helping to keep the community safe. We've made it the entire year without having to close once. On May 11, which is today, Amy turns 40. It would make her day if you could wish her a happy birthday on the podcast. I know that listening to you each week has helped her make it through this pandemic and in turn helped keep our school and town safer. It would mean a lot. Thanks so much for all you guys do, John. Happy birthday, Amy. (laughs) Happy birthday, Amy. Sadly, this will come out uh, two days after your birthday, but we hope we made you another month for you. That's very nice. And and just, I read it because you need to know that John, your husband, did this for you. <laughs> it's very cool. Uh, Kathy, can you read the next one? 
Sure. Jens Kuhn writes, today I listened to number 750 and had a few minor thoughts. Cattle versus cows. The species is Bos taurus, Linnaeus 1758. The standardized vernacular name for the member of this species is Arax, Wilson and Reeder Mammal Species of the World, third edition. My understanding is that cattle refers to domesticated and likely interbred aurochs populations. That is, cattle is much more an agricultural, similar to swine, than a zoological term, such as domestic pigs. Once you go down that road, a cow is not just a female cattle, it is also needs to have given birth. Females that have not given birth under three years of age are called heifers, and all kinds of other fun names are used for other females that make foreign English learners want to jump out of windows. <laughs> so yes, stick to cattle as long as the animal is not wild. The name, and it's I'll just spell it first, L-L-O-V-I-U, virus, is derived from the name of a cave in Spain, the LL is therefore pronounced ye, yovu or yovu virus is how he's telling us that should be pronounced. Mortality <laughs> rate. Mortality is a rate by epidemiological definition, so there's no need to say rate. <laughs> However, mortality is defined as the number of deaths per number of apparently healthy population. Typically, I think, per 100,000 healthy population per time frame. This means that the mortality of Ebola virus disease is very low. The case fatality rate equals lethality is the number of dead per number of sick. This means that the case fatality rate equals the lethality of Ebola virus disease. It's concerningly high. So the mortality of Ebola virus disease is low. Mm. The case fatality rate, which is the same as the lethality of Ebola virus disease, is concerningly high. Huh. Glad to be back. He, he wrote to us that he had uh, been listening at 2x to I don't know how many podcasts he had to catch up on, but <laughs> just huh. had thoughts on one. It's interesting. So Arach would include all of these silly names, right? So if we refer to these, is, is that the umbrella term? Can we refer to uh, heifers and cattle and uh, cows and steers as Bulls, are all yeah. Arochs? Yeah, I believe so. So I can go have an Auroch burger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, just you, no one's going to know what you're talking about, but that's, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, But at least I'll be correct. You yeah. will. I didn't know a heifer is, a, is something specific. How about that? Yeah. I mean, why, Jens, do you know this? <laughs> <laughs> he is a student really? of the English language. He is. I'll say. For sure. Yovu. That's cool. Yeah, I think I remember that, but I forgot it at the time. All right, so case fatality rate, and mm -hmm. then we have infection re fatality rate, which tries to approximate the actual um, right. case fatality, right? By approx Because the case fatality is the number of dead over the number of confirmed ill. Infected, I guess. So, and and we we never know everyone. So that's where infection fatality rate comes in, right? Rich, you wrote about that last year. I did. Okay, so what's the IFR for for SARS-CoV-2? Do you know? Uh, geez, I haven't looked this up uh, for a long, long time. Last I looked it up, it was uh, they were kind of honing in on about point uh, five percent. Mm-hmm. Okay. It would be interesting to look it up again since there are, is now so much more there. Are, there's so much more data now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by the way, this Thank is you. really off the wall, but LL, if you're Welsh, I believe, is pronounced something akin to CHL. Mm -hmm. huh. So yeah. if this was a uh, named after a cave in Wales, it would be. Love you. <laughs> right. And in not all Spanish is the L L a Y. I think there are some variations even on that. So, so take that, Jens. Jens. <laughs> <laughs> Jens. Yes. Jens. Jens. Uh, he says, uh, good to be back. All right. Welcome back. And Jens, yeah, you know, we, we did read your last letter and you had, you had, you had lamented non-COVID virology and we're, we've resumed that. So, uh, you know, it was yeah. partly because you wanted Enjoy. to, yeah, we're doing one a week of non-COVID virology. 
Although you never can escape it completely because there's always something and there's always email, but that's good. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Carson writes, hello, Twiv. I've been listening since the pandemic started and love your content, knowledge, and everything you share. Thank you for all that you do. I'm just a small business owner, software developer from Englewood, next to Denver, Colorado, where it is currently sunny and beautiful at 34 degrees Fahrenheit. I am wondering why someone with proven natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2 through a documented infection who successfully and quickly recovered without any lingering effects, without any comorbidities, with a strong immune system, et cetera, would or should consider taking one of the vaccines. Why would or should someone with this experience status take on the unknown, potentially negative long-term effects of one of the vaccines on top of the unknown, potentially long negative long-term effects of having had COVID-19? I ask this, especially in consideration of the peer reviewed study that shows na that natural immunity has been shown to be effective against all of the known variants. Um, and he gives both a link to a Reuters article as well as a link to the uh, study itself. Is there, are there any studies that explain why someone with this history should consider vaccination? Thank you for any insight you can offer. Um, so I can give you my perspective on this. Um, Carson, uh, which is that um, we know that infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, includes uh, some of these proteins other than spike, like the one that you've just heard about, um, as well as some others that seem to um, alter the immune response. Um, we've talked about a paper in the past where we can see that in some infected individuals, um, the germinal centers in the lymph nodes um, seem to have uh, a structure that is not um, ideal. And so maybe the antibody response is not um, sort of the normal response you would, might have. And so I would wonder about things like the longevity of that immune response um, that comes from infection and sort of whether that uh, immune response is sort of as broad and as ideal, I can't think of a better word, uh, that it might that it might be otherwise, um, while a vaccine elicited response seems to be quite good right now. Um, and so if I were in that situation, I personally would get vaccinated because I would want to make sure that I was making sort of uh, the best possible immune response I could make that was not being inhibited by one of these other proteins that's not spike. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. I also want to point out that the article does not say that natural immunity is effective against all the known variants. It says that after an infection, you have T cells recognizing the epitopes, and those are all conserved among the variants. That's all that it says, okay, which w also is what Alessandro Sette said, if you remember, okay? And so that's different. I mean, it may confer recovery or prevention of severe disease, but it doesn't mean that natural immunity is effective against all the known variants, right? That's right. I want to throw something else out here and get your reaction to this, because what I think of is that we have done placebo-controlled, double-blind, random-controlled trials with the vaccine to demonstrate its effectiveness. We have not done that with the virus, <laughs> okay? So I don't really know what sort of immunity you get out of the viral infection, I do out of the vaccine. Uh, plus, you know, there really, uh, there are no downsides that we know of, and there are none that we can, uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, you can talk about long-term effects and that kind of stuff. That's uh, strictly hypothetical. Mm -hmm. There's no absolutely no evidence whatsoever that any of that stuff is gonna happen. So the way I see it, there's no downside uh, and there's a good test to show that it is effective. Okay. Whereas we don't have the same tests yeah, uh, with the virus. Nevertheless, it's a good question. I mean, it's, I'm, this is not to bash the question. It's a, a very oh, legitimate no, it's, question. It's definitely a legitimate question. And I have, I think said this on the podcast before. I know I've told other people about it. Um, so uh, Carico and Weissman worked together at Penn and that led eventually to the mRNA vaccines. I listened to a lecture that both of them gave back to back. And Weissman uh, talked about some of the development of the mRNA vaccines using other viruses, including influenza. And the 
big take home message for me was that he said what we saw was that the immunity that we were getting with these mRNA vaccines was better than the immuni- than the natural immunity from the infection. And he said, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> I mean, it was just so remarkable that this vaccine is better than natural, gives, giving better immunity than natural. What does immunity. better mean though? Uh, Do you know? What do they I mean? beg your pardon? What do they mean by better? It's cause well, it's- I can't I can't remember the details, okay. whether it was both cellular and uh, humoral, but it just made a big impression on me. Um, and so, uh, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, what was I going to say? I forgot. Okay, let's move on. R- uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Ryan writes, <clears throat> and he sends a link to uh, an article, hang on, let me get this up here, in, uh, it's from uh, NBC, Um, some online bit says, Connecticut Senate passes a bill to remove religious exemptions for child vaccinations. Dear Microbe TV podcasts, I have mentioned vaccine debates in the past, but had no idea. The impact is way bigger than I was thinking back in 2019. Now the state of Connecticut has passed a vaccine law similar to California's SB 276 and SB 277, removing non-medical exemptions to vaccine. Yes, it's poignant given the impact of SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in the past year. Yeah. So interesting. I wonder if we'll get more of that. Probably. I have uh, a feeling we might. Where where uh, uh, this is going to heat up? I think in the face of the fall, where uh, we're going to want everybody to go back to school. All right. Uh, yes. And. And so that it's going to heat up in terms of, you know, requiring vaccinations and what can exempt you and that kind of stuff. It, it's already heating up with some of the colleges and universities that have uh, come up with requirements. Um, there has already started to be some pushback. May it change a little bit with the licensing of uh, mm-hmm. at least the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. opposed to it just being... EUA Mm -hmm. authorized. True. Because there can be requirements for other vaccines at, I mean, there have been in universities. Certainly it will change, could change things for the military. Mm. Uh, Rich, I remember that TWIV we did at Irvine with the vaccinology people and the one doc said there should be no more than 1% medical exemptions in the U.S. population. And in some counties in Texas, it's as high as 50%, you know, yeah. because people use it as an excuse, right. not as a reflection of their medical condition. So I think it's good. The more states, the better. I think others have already eliminated it. I hope it stands. I really do. Let's do one more round here. Gregory writes, on a recent TWIV, Vincent claimed that George Gao, head of CDC China, had said that coronavac is only 50% effective. This is wrong, but I don't blame Vincent. This issue has been widely misreported in the media. <laughs> George Gao did not make any claim about the efficacy of any particular vaccine. He certainly did not name a specific percentage for any vaccine. He gave a talk at a conference about vaccines. And in one of his slides, he gave some general thoughts on how to improve the efficacy of vaccines with not high efficacy. He did not name any specific vaccine. He said that one can try modifying the schedule of the second dose or using a different vaccine for the second dose. He also praised mRNA vaccines. George Gao's slide was seized upon by someone at a think tank, the thank the Council on Foreign Relations, who claimed that George Gao had admitted that Chinese vaccines don't work provides a Twitter link for that. This spread like wildfire in the media. Even the BBC misreported the story. George Gao gave a subsequent interview in which he said his statement had been misrepresented. Gives a link to that. But few in the Western media seem to care. My interpretation of this entire affair is that the Council on Foreign Relations cynically wanted to score geopolitical points by dunking on Chinese vaccines. Unlike the U.S., which until a few days ago, had exported almost no vaccine doses. 
China has exported nearly half of all the vaccine doses it has produced so far. Painting Chinese vaccines as somehow defective is a convenient way to negate any image gains China might make through its more generous vaccine export policy. Aside from misrepresenting George Gao's word, the two things went missing in the media coverage of the story. One, there are ch several Chinese vaccines. Sinovac and Sinopharm have each developed inactivated whole virus vaccines. CanSino has developed a single-dose adenovirus vector vaccine. Anhui Shifei Longcom has developed a protein subunit vaccine. They have different efficacies. They're all low by the incredibly high standard of the mRNA vaccines, but some are similar to AstraZeneca and J&J &J vaccines. Two, efficacy can mean different things. What endpoint are we talking about? Prevention of mild symptoms, prevention of serious disease, prevention of death. I recall that Alan Dove raised this point. There's a serious worldwide shortage of vaccines right now, and a vaccine that reduces chance of serious disease or death by an order of magnitude will still make a huge difference. I love your show, but I just wanted to correct this one issue. All the best and thanks for your hard work and put it, putting together episodes week after week. So, uh, yes, uh, I thought he had said that, my, my um, error. And um, it sounds like a reasonable scenario for what happened. <laughs> Thank you, Gregory. So the Council on Foreign Relations. Mm-hmm is a U.S. nonprofit think tank specializing in U.S. foreign policy and international affairs. Just put that out there. You can look it up in Wikipedia. They are their, their own deal. And they've been around since uh, 1918. Mm -hmm. I swear I saw him. Yeah, I saw, I saw a headline in a paper somewhere. That 50, Gao says 50%, right? I yeah, guess I guess so he didn't say it. Okay. May culpa. They goofed up. Okie dokie. Kathy, can you take the next one? Greg writes, salutations, TWIF team. It's 72 degrees Fahrenheit in Haiku, Maui. My wife and I are both vaccinated. She'll get a second shot of the Moderna in a little over a week. And so are the three grandparents in our bubble, as is my father in Utah. What a relief. I'm just coming out of a kind of honeymoon glow. Now it's time to think about the rest of the world, and that includes my kid. We're eager to give our nine-year-old daughter vaccinated, get our nine-year-old daughter vaccinated as soon as possible. It looks like we'll have to wait a while. Given the recent news about breast milk containing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in JAMA, and uh, gives a link, we wonder, can she be effectively immunized by drinking breast milk from a vaccinated nursing mother? If so, how much Mookie would confer the effective dose? <laughs> Sincerely, Greg. Um, so uh, what did we say it is now? It's uh, 12 to 15. So we still have to 15. wait a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any idea how much breast milk you'd have to drink to. Yeah. I don't think we know what the effective dose is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And, and she then, need to keep drinking it. Yep. Because, yes. Uh, you have to have she, a steady diet. It, right. it, you know, she would passive antibody transfer, uh, not actually making the B cells to make the response herself. Yeah. So she'd only be protected for as long as she was drinking the milk. Yep. P.S. Since I have just referenced an article from Israel, I want to raise the issue of vaccine injustice in Gaza and the West Bank. As I understand it, Palestinian workers in Israel are being vaccinated, but the partially recognized and blockaded state of Palestine has only been able to secure doses in the tens of thousands for a population of over 5 million people. Your conversations on TWIV have regularly touched on the Israeli vaccination program, but you've skirted the issue of injustice across the barrier walls separating Israel from the majority of the Palestinian people. I'm sure I'm not the only listener to point this out. Please bring back that feeling we got when you paused from virology to show solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement over the summer. Your work gives hope to many people, and I call on you to let that blossom further than the various barriers to public health internationally. So, yeah, Greg, that's a good point. But, you know, Palestinian workers in Israel are getting vaccinated, but the rest of the 5 million people in Palestine are not. I was not aware of this issue. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. Yeah, and, that's, uh, that's my thought, too. I yep. didn't realize how much of a disparity there was there. Right. And vaccine equity is, of course, a serious problem that needs to be dealt with. Yeah. I don't know. What do, what do you do, though? I mean... 
Pay. I mean, you know, for the thing that jumps to mind is COVAX. That's the only, yeah. the only thing I know of, which is, you know, a, a global agency, an international agency that uh, is dedicated to trying to bring uh, vaccines to uh, underserved and at-risk populations. But I don't know how successful they are or what uh, mechanisms they actually use. I don't think they've been wildly successful so far. Um, but, and, you know, I don't know what you do. And it may be that as... You know, I think I just read another country is going to stop their contract with AstraZeneca. Maybe it was the UK. Um, so there may be, you know, AstraZeneca vaccines that will be available. Mm. You know, maybe things will spread out more with time, but it's just, a, you know, how long is that time going to be? Yeah, if you if you if you search Not for this. until everybody's vaccinated. If you search, right. this is a big story. Uh, Palestine bearing the brunt of vaccination inequalities, yeah, from the BMJ. Um, and COVAX, Rich, is trying to get them vaccines, yes. So uh, in early April, they got about 50,000 doses of vaccine as part of the COVAX program, but that's not very much, right? So they're working on it. It's a problem, yeah. Uh, Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Tamara writes... I got to use the new Abbott Binax Now rapid at-home antigen test on my elementary school kid who had a sore throat this morning. <laughs> Instructions were clear and it was easy to do. And she was negative, which I figured was the case, but had to double check before sending her to school. For $10 to $12 per test, it's totally worth it. So happy to have this option, even though we thankfully have free PCR tests here in Nebraska with a less than 24 hour turnaround. And I definitely preferred using an anterior nary swab on my kid versus making her get a nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, best tomorrow. And tomorrow also sends a photo um, of the instructions. Hmm. That's a lateral flow looks like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, that's not the exact incarnation of Mina's idea, right? But it's close. Mm -hmm. Right. We seem to be inching closer to that. Where do you get these, though? Can you just buy them? Seems like it. Let's see. FDA authorized. Yeah, you can buy them. <laughs> Here's one place selling it for 25 bucks. You have to buy 1,224 of them. That's no uh, good. Mm, that's a little too many. Here's a two pack at a drugstore for, yeah, $70. A one pack for fifty dollars, so it's the price seems to vary depending on where you live. Hmm. Oh, that's good though. I'd seek it out if I needed to. <clears throat> and Rich Haley writes, "Hi, Twiv. I'm a longtime listener of your podcast and really appreciate the work you guys do to inform the public about all things COVID. I have a question about post-vaccine long-term effects that I'm hoping you guys." Uh, could help me understand. <clears throat> I got both doses of Pfizer, dose one, March 23rd, dose two, April 13th. After each dose, I appeared, I uh, experienced all of the usual side effects. But they lasted about, for about two weeks. After dose one, I got a migraine that lasted almost 10 days. Uh, and I was so fatigued that I couldn't get off my couch. Symptoms improved for the most part before dose two, but I'm still dealing with almost daily headaches and muscle joint pain in my legs. I haven't been able to exercise or live daily life due to this pain, and doctors don't know what to do. I'm all for vaccination, but as a 26-year-old woman, I regret getting a vaccine. I feel it's done more harm to my body than good. I've seen this type of thing reported among women on other social media forums, although I take these reports with a grain of salt. Is there any data from the trials or real world that could give us an idea as to why this happens? I would also love if you have any thoughts on what I could tell my doctors about how to treat me. This feels like long COVID from a vaccine. Please help, Haley. Okay, I just have a couple of thoughts about this. First of all, um, uh, my wife had a, a pretty drawn out reaction to the second dose of the Moderna vaccine. That doesn't sound quite as severe as this, but uh, she was uh, feeling sort of 
weak and fatigued for a couple of weeks afterwards. And we actually wrote Daniel on this and said, hey, Daniel, have you seen this before? And uh, we didn't get a really definitive answer from Daniel, but I got the impression that, um, uh, it, you know, it's not like it was uh, unheard of, put it that way. Um, I would say uh, 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 from everything I know, chances are that I, I, I hear your pain, but chances are it's you're going to get through this and you're going to be okay. Uh, and it's better than COVID. All right. Um, by, uh, by a long shot. Um, so, you know, it's a, it, it's a tough one in terms of, uh, treatment or how common it is or anything like that. I can't address that. I had a, a similar, um, question for Daniel about a friend of mine and, uh, she said in the end, basically, he said that the system isn't doing quite enough to warn people that these vaccines can pack a punch for some people. And um, so it sounds like, you know, Daniel may have more experience with this. And Daniel, if you're listening and you want to add it to your list of things to talk about in the clinical <laughs> report. Yeah, that'd uh, be good. It might be good to hear about. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I haven't seen any specific data on anything no. like this. Um, I mean, I've heard, as she says, anecdotal data from people who have longer, but nothing beyond a couple of weeks. Right. I so as Rich said, I suspect Haley, you're going to eventually recover, but I do know people who have very serious uh, longer effects after the vaccines for sure, but they all seem to resolve. Uh, well, so yeah, let's just see if Daniel, I suspect Daniel doesn't have any explanation or any treatment because it's been too soon. Right. All right. Time for some picks of the week. Brianne, what do you have for us? Uh, so I have an app that I was recently um, introduced to. Um, I have the link here to the uh, Apple App Store. Um, it's also available on Google Play or other things. Um, and this is a free app uh, called uh, lab hacks, uh, hmm. which is your everyday laboratory assistant. Um, and it has uh, sections that do all sorts of conversions um, that we frequently have to do in the lab, um, different types of dilution calculators and other types of calculators. Uh, my favorite, which is uh, a timer that can time multiple things at once um, that can, you can label which thing you're timing with which timer um, and all sorts of just little helpful things um, that are nice to have in your pocket. Um, while you are doing your lab work. So I thought that was useful for people. That's great. It's about time. Yeah. <laughs> but I have, uh, does it have formula weights for all the uh, <laughs> common things we use? Um, I have not, I didn't see the formula weights, uh, but it, I, it has like a lot of good stuff. It actually has a, um, also I forgot, it has playlists made for different lab activities and it also has a codon chart. <laughs> oh, codon chart would be nice. Yeah. I still carry a lot of formula weights around in my head. Yeah, sodium chloride. Mm -hmm. 58.44. And Tris? 121.1. Yeah, nice. Those are the two I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, do you know sodium hydroxide? Oh, 40? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, a little nerd there. <laughs> good yeah. job. Very good. They should have a link to Twiv, Brianne, to listen they to should, Twiv. They, they should, well, <laughs> now that I you know have talked about them, maybe they'll uh, get that link too. They, they could, we could work so, it out. Just so you know, it's lab.hacks if you're looking for it. Um, yes, cool. that's true. It's that's lab very cool. Hacks. That's very cool. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I have two. One last minute thing that I just snuck in there because of our conversation. But the first was sent to me by my friend Nassim Misachi. And it is an article, uh, sort of a news article in Nature, actually, that is reporting on a couple of articles that recently appeared in Science and is titled Weird DNA Spills Secrets to Biologists. Uh, and the bottom line here is that there are some phage that have some sort of a system that programs to substitute uh, adenine in their genomes with, uh, what is it? to amino adenine, hmm. okay? Uh, and they have a wonderful picture 
this is what finally convinced me to do this as a pick. A wonderful picture in here of the base pairing properties of two amino adenine uh, compared to uh, regular adenine, and it forms three rather than two hydrogen bonds. It was originally discovered because uh, some people discovered some funny melting properties of this phage DNA. It took a lot more heat to melt it than they could rationalize based on the uh, GC content. Okay, because these are more stable base pairs. Uh, and this uh, goes through these articles. Uh, apparently, they've uh, discovered some of the uh, phage encoded enzymes that could be responsible for doing the appropriate metabolism to make uh, DNA uh, containing this. And uh, we can only really guess at the uh, purpose of this, but one is that it may not be subject to degradation by. Uh, some of the normal uh, degradation enzymes to give the phage an advantage uh, in the cell. But I thought that this was uh, really cool. Yeah, cool. It Very, is you know, really cool. A awesome. different base. It's great. Really nice. Uh, and I just wanted to <laughs> slip in here, um, since we were talking about COVAX, because I think this is an important organization. I put in a link to COVAX as another pick. You can you can read about this at several different sites, but this is the World Health Organization site. You can read about what they're trying to do. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, Kathy, what do you have for us? I have something that's called, uh, I've just been watching it, so sorry. Um, <laughs> what is it called? Planet Earth Now, yes. And um, this is really cool. It may, it may have been picked before, but it reminds me of something that I saw at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. I remember standing in this room where the screen changed between fields like this. I'm, I probably was there for 20 to 30 minutes <laughs> watching the screens. But um, this is showing you the earth now and you can, um, you can uh, change between, you know, what's the carbon monoxide levels over the earth at the moment, the soil moisture, the ozone, gravity field, sea level, you know, sea level isn't always sea level. <laughs> I mean, green is where it's close to zero. And then there's places where it's the, the oceans are above sea level and <laughs> where it's um, not so many where it's below, but a few spots. Um, and shows, you can also click on satellites now. And so it shows you where the ISS is and other satellites. Um, it's just really cool. So it's a, it's a NASA, it's got the NASA meatball up in the top left, so it's a, it's a NASA thing, but um, yeah. So this is amazing, Kathy. I really like this. this is super cool. <laughs> I thought you might. Yeah, and I you can't can, remember how I even found it. You but can it was click on the uh, the things orbiting, and you you zoom in and get a picture yeah. of it. It's very cool. Wow, very cool. You see, Kate. Uh, I, I have Kate's one. Down. Oh. Kate's back on Earth. Kate's yeah. Kate's back on Earth. Nice. Uh, I have one. Uh, correction for NASA. Let me get it back here because I strayed away. In the lower right-hand corner, it says, animate this data. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you bet. Right. You bet. Yeah. Fine, guys. Yeah. They don't listen to Twib. Apparently not. Yeah. That's very cool. Very nice. Rich, you know that interview of mine you were said you were listening to? Yeah. Don't listen too closely on that point. <laughs> oh, gee. Okay. I haven't finished it yet. I haven't I, noticed any boobers I, ca yet. I caught myself once. <laughs> um, so Maybe you should listen to Twiv, uh, Brianne. I probably <laughs> should. Uh, cool. The, check, check out the gravity field. I don't know what that means. If, if the, this is that why this is why some days you have a bad day. Yeah. That you're in an excess gravity zone. Well, are, so is Michigan right now in an excess one and Texas is <laughs> in minimum or is it the other way around? I don't know. Going to yeah. have to have a look. I don't know how to read the gravity field. Maybe cool. a listener will help. Very neat. Very neat. <laughs> anyway, check it out. Nice. All right. My my pick is part of Viral Zone. So Viral Zone is a great site that was picked years ago here. I don't even know who picked it. I might have picked it. I've always thought it needed an update, but in fact, it changes a lot. It's a great site with, you know, classification and many other things. And they have a page on the SARS-CoV-2 variants, which is useful. It provides a chart of, you know, the variants of concern, the variants of interest, and 
the changes in them that and where they are in, in the spike, uh, the N-terminal domain of spike, receptor binding domain, um, and other parts of spike and so forth. And uh, then there's a bigger table below on where they are and what, they, what they're thought to be doing. So it's a good place to have all of them together. SARS-CoV-2 circulating variants at viral zone. And uh, I have to say that uh, years ago, <laughs> um, I don't know how I first discovered it, but I went there and, you know, right on the front page, they have this thing called Virology News. And it says, TWIV, This Week in Virology is a weekly podcast animated by professors Vincent Racaniello and Dick Depommier from the Columbia University, USA. And it has, it's still there. It's slowly moved down the page. <laughs> but they haven't changed it. And they still have the old TWIV logo and they still have me and Dick. <laughs> No, <laughs> they do have a link. They actually have a link to TWIV, uh, which gets redirected. And I think it's just great that they have that there and uh, have kept it there. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great site, actually, by the way. One of the things I like, uh, yeah, Viral Zone is just awesome. One of the things that I really like about this actually is at the top of this, they have the uh, three-dimensional ribbon diagram of the spike protein that you can spin around and over on the right hand yeah, side, yeah. you can click various uh, sure. uh, sub bits of it that are then highlighted. So if you want to have a look at this, you can, you can see in nice. sort of a 3D model, all of the stuff that we've been talking about. It's, and, and they even map where the uh, mutants are uh, and, and et cetera. So you can see their relevance. It's very, very, very oh, well that's done. Cool. That's, that's really well useful. Very well done. Yeah. Very nice. It's, it's interesting because in this first table, they have four variants of concern and some other number of variants of interest. And then in the table below, there's there's uh, one, yeah. two, three, four, five variants of concern. So anyway, it, it's, it's still really nice. I like it. I had, a, I had an interaction with uh, the people at Viral Zone some time ago because we were working on the um, structure of box viruses and the sort of the old time textbook um, representation of pox viruses that have a dumbbell shaped core mm -hmm. is incorrect. And uh, we sort of revisited that whole thing. And uh, I forget how it came up, <clears throat> but somehow uh, uh, I may have even, I don't know. I got in touch with somehow, I got in touch with uh, somebody at uh, viral zone who was, you know, supervising the images that they use. And we got into a discussion about how the image was wrong. And we spent weeks going over and over this thing mm. to revise the image so that it was correct back and forth, back and forth in a, in a very, uh, you know, academic fashion. And these, uh, these guys are so, you know, they're so on it. Yep. Right. And it's such an altruistic endeavor. I just really appreciate it. It's great. It is a product of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, by the way. Um, really good. All right. That'll do it for TWIV754, microbe.tv slash TWIV for the show notes. If you want to send a question or comment, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you want to send a question to Daniel, that would be Daniel at microbe.tv. And if you're interested in supporting us, there are a couple of ways that you can do that, microbe.tv slash contribute. Brian Barker is at Drew University on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>